Um, uh, okay, let's get started. Uh, so today I'll talk about the parsing, parsing, um, uh, especially is algorithms, models, and resources. And here's the outline. The first one is, the first piece is about algorithms. That is, how do we decompose the complex output of the dependency tree? So we have typical two, like, two conventional methods, different methods to uh, get this output. And next we'll talk about the models from like very old feature-based models to like old neural network and recent feature models. And uh, the last piece is about the resources. So we'll look specifically about the universal dependencies and cross-lingual transfer on it. Uh, here's a recap of uh, what we learned in the last, last lecture. So we learned uh, free structure trees and dependency trees. So if we compare these two forms, sure. Oh, sure, sure. Sure. Uh, so we uh, we learned these two formulas. Uh, if we compare them, the biggest difference is that phrase trees have these internal nodes that represent a phrase, like here VP or non verb phrase or non phrase. But in dependency tree, the um, the node is the words by themselves. So, but but you can imagine that, for example, the central verb here V is like a higher node of the uh, structure of the sentence. And there are certain uh, properties for this dependency tree. So first, there are no multi-edge. That means that between each uh, two of the nodes, there's at most one edge. We cannot have multiple edge between two nodes. And second, the slightly stronger is that for each of the word in this in this dependency tree, there's one and only one head word. A one exception is this artificial root node, which represents like the, the highest node of the century, but the sentence it does not have any head. And third one is there are no cycles because as the name suggests, it is a tree and there are no cycles in it. And the fourth one is optional one. So most of the, uh, for example, in English and Mandarin, like most of the trees will have this property that it means projective. Uh, the, the easiest uh, method to understand is this, is that if you draw this tree in a 1D plane, there will be no crossing edges. So all of the edges will not cross against each other. So this is a property called projective. And uh, we will first look at algorithms for, uh, for decoding this kind of dependency trees. So this is a structure prediction problem. So the output is not only one label or one scalar node, it's a, a collection of multiple values. So we need to find some way to decompose these complex targets. Uh, conventionally speaking, there are two ways of doing this. The first one is called graph based parsing. It decomposes the whole tree into individual individual subtrees. So here the keyword is individual. So that we, all of these subtrees do not interference with each other and will be scored individually. And the second uh, category is called transition-based. Transition so the decoding procedure will be decomposed into a series of transition actions. Uh, so like uh, most traditional ones like shift to reduce parsing, we'll describe this later. And the one like feature, some of the transition steps do not introduce any like fancy edges. It will simply do something shift a node from like a buffer to a stack. We will describe this uh, in details later. And so here, so we, uh, we can relook at the properties of a well-formed tree and look at how do we decode, decode them if we have these properties. So uh, if we have the first property, there are no multiple edges. If we only consider this property, then the decoding will be very simple. Like each, it will be a binary classification of all the edges of in, inside this tree. And if we further consider like single head constraint, like only each of the word has one and only one head word, then things will become like had multiple classification. Like we find the head word of each of the nodes. So up, up on here, this things will be very simple. We do not need like specific algorithms for it. But if we further consider this as a cyclic, like it will be a tree, there, are, there should be no cycles in it. Then we need some specific algorithms to decode it because there are, these constraints are not easily satisfied by really local algorithms. Uh, so uh, we will later introduce uh, this specific algorithm for deco uh, decoding dependent trees. And lastly, if we further constrain, uh, like, uh, consider the uh, the most strict constraint, like pr projective constraint. So projective again means that this kind of crossing edges is not allowed. And we have another different algorithm for it. It's called it's dynamic programming algorithms. 
It's called Asterisk because it's uh, invented by this person. Uh, and it is actually, you can imagine it as a determinist version of Slack K algorithm, which we described in the last lecture. And I will speak, uh, I will slightly describe this uh, non projective first order Poisson algorithms. So remember that this is an uh, exact algorithm for, for this problem. That means that it can re return the maximum, exactly maximum tree of it. Uh, I borrowed the, uh, borrow the example from this paper. You can look at this uh, for more details. So imagine here we want to decode uh, this very simple sentence, John saw Mary. And first we have some model to give some scores of all of the edges between genomes. For example, like John to saw is 20, so to John is 30. And the first step is gradient maximum. So this means that for each of the word inside this, uh, uh, inside this graph, we take its maximum incoming edge. So here for John, the maximum incoming edge is from Saul to John, that's 30. And the maximum of, for Saul is from John to Saul, that will be 20. And the maximum incoming edge from Mary is 30 from Saul. And up, after this step, if, if there are no cycle in this graph, then things are already done because like all of the constraints are already satisfied and there are no cycles and everything is maximum locally. <coughs> And things are great, but if we have cycles and we need to like resolve this cycle because in a well formed chemistry there should not be any cycles. So this is a very clever like clever method for for, the, for doing this. It's uh for each for each of the cycle it regards this cycle as a new node, and then the larger graph will be contracted into a smaller graph. So here, so for example here we have John and so is. Uh, cycle here and we contract it into a smaller smaller node and that will, that will contain both John and so and then in the new graph like smaller graph then for all of the output edge we simply out, uh, up, uh, up, output the maximum edge to, to its outside ones and the, the things need to be take, taken more careful about is the incoming edge so for example like from root to this new edge, we can choose root to salt as it. And if we choose root to salt, then we cannot choose John to salt because for each of the nodes, there can be only one type word. So here, if we choose root to salt, and then we should only choose salt to John. And then the, the weight of this new edge will be the summation of these two edges. So that will be 10 plus 30, that will be 40. And if we choose root to John, another node inside this uh, contracting node. And this, this single edge score will be nine, but if we choose this, then we cannot choose Saul to John. We have to choose John to Saul. And then the score will be 29. It is smaller than the like larger 41. So we, select, we still keep the highest node. And after doing this, we have a smaller graph than the remaining graph. And we recursively call this, uh, call this algorithms. And finally, because the graph is shrinking by the size, and finally, and if you uh, if you imagine, you can imagine at the uh, very simplest case, like where we have one node, we will not have any cycles. So finally, we will. Uh, so finally, we will have an answer. And after we get this, we will recursively. Uh, we will after uh, this answer is returned from the recursive call, we will repack things and return the uh, final maximum scoring tree. And so, uh, uh, so that is the first category of parsing algorithms called graph-based parser. It composes the larger graph into smaller pieces. And the second group is called transition-based parsers, where we like the most traditional one is uh, a shift-reduced kind of parsing, which is similar to like when we parse artificial languages. So, for example, uh, so here we maintain some like structures of the parsing. Uh, Parsing space, and we have a step which stores the partial parse trees we build, and we have word list, or it can also be called buffer. Have and in, inside that it, we have the words that are not processed, and the action means that we do something to this partial space, and and, and either change those space or build new edges. So we have sh shift our uh, shift actions, which simply take the first word in the, inside the buffer and put it in the stack. For example, in this uh, book, Mid Morning Flight, we first do two shifts and then 
we, the first two words will be put into the stack. And later we have here write arc action. This is uh, called, also called reduce action, which will create, which will first create a new edge, for example, here from book to me. And second, it will reduce this me node. And there are many other varieties of this kind of transition system. So here is the most simplest one. And as we go on, we, uh, we continue to shift the morning flight and like let, so uh, this shift, uh, this reduce actions can have two directions because when we build it, the dependent trees have directions and we can either appoint from right to left or left to right. That is best to build uh, dependent edges of different directions. And finally, after we do all of this, if we, if on the stack there is only like one artificial root node, then we are done because all of the uh, words have already been processed. And this is the like the most traditional shift reduce parser. And more broadly speaking, transition parser can are not constrained to like left to right shift reduce things. And here's a paper uh, with, which you can check later, which describes uh, different varieties of transition systems. Uh, I will slightly describe a specific uh, variation of transition based systems, which is called easy first parsing. It is also called non-directional because it does not have a strict left to right directional uh, parsing uh, paradigm. And the, the, main, the main difference is that, so here we do not have explicit stack or buffer. So we view all of the nodes inside, uh, in, uh, inside the current state as candidates to, to build, build dependency edge. But there's one constraint that the for each step, we, on, we can only build edges between two nearby nodes. Uh, for example, at the very first step, we only consider each of the nearby words and we score each of them and at each step. So, so here it calls easy first, that means like the highest score first. What the model thinks easy is easy, maybe the model will assign higher scores to it. Uh, so for example, in, in this first step, the first, uh, the maximum score will be like brown fox and then we'll put them together. And so this will be like iterative done on here. We do not have any node to reduce. And in, in this case, like there will be no shift. There will be no shift actions. All the actions will be uh, arc attached left or attached right. And all of these actions will create new apps. And, but the uh, slider downside of it. So this is uh, fle more flexible than strict left to right systems. But the downside of it is because, as you can see, like left to right, should reduce parses only need to process. You can process the sentence in linear time. But here we need some extra, uh, extra efforts to. Uh, so actually, this this can be done like in log n time. But uh, a naive, uh, a naive. But this needs some like more complex data structures. But not a naive speaking like will be like n square time. And actually, like uh, with proper encoding, actually a dependency tree can be cast as a sequence, and we can even do sequence labeling. We can cast the dependency parsing problem as a sequence labeling problem. And so, so here's a paper that uh, describes several different uh, conventions to doing this. So basically, it is uh, they encode the uh, had position as a relative position. For example, here, if you look at relative position one, so here plus one means that it's had word is to uh, the position of the had word to this current word is plus one in the relations non subject. And in this way, like the whole tree will be compressed as a sequence of labels, and we can do sequence labeling for it. Um, Actually, like for parsing algorithm, there are much more to say. So here is a good tutorial for it. It's, it's like seven years ago. And actually seven years ago, when there are not too many neural network methods, like most of efforts in dependent parsing is on the algorithms. Especially for, for graph-based parsing, remember that we only talk about first order parsing algorithms. Actually, there are like large, lots of works on higher order parsing. That means that we, that we decompose the, the full tree into like higher order structures, like a, a subtree that can compare one node and siblings, or one node, not only 
the parent nodes, parent work, and also the parent of the parent word, which is called as grandparent. And, and the, uh, although, although this, this higher order Pascal algorithm can bring some accuracy improvements, it will be like significantly slower. And we also have some pruning algorithm, pruning methods for it. And for the transi transitional based methods, we have uh, different varieties of transition systems. And actually, interestingly, like for, even for transition based parsing, we can also do dynamic programming. Uh, actually, this is on, not only for graph based parsing. And another big, uh, is, a big problem for transition based parsing is that how to train this parser. And we can have, uh, there are many different methods to channel them. And there are lots of interesting points here. And surely there are ways to combine these like, two different styling, uh, two different methods of parsing. And here's a paper uh, talking about it. And it has a nice title, a tale of two parsers. So you can see it's from a tale of two cities. And it investigates like how do we combine graph-based and transition-based parsers. And so, so as, as you can see, like from 2008 and 2014, so most of the uh, research efforts dependent parsing is on building these more complex, uh, more complex parsing algorithms. And as a final summation of these two methods, graph-based parsers. Uh, factorize the full parser into local subtrees. But the good thing about this is that we can do global inference of it. So of the most of the algorithms in, especially the first order ones, the simplest first order ones of the graphic process can be exactly so. But the downside of it, it needs usually and cube time. Um, and for transition belts, based process is locally normalized. So this means that usually, usually we cannot find out the exact solution for it, but we usually need to do something like gradient search or beam search. But the good, good thing about this is, is, is that it has rich output features. And usually, especially like if we do shift to use parsing, usually things can be done in linear time. Uh, but here, I, I put a note here, things, uh, if, when we're talking about time complexity, things actually change now, especially when we're using different models. And there are also papers comparing these two methods, and they can reach similar results on uh, like a variety of languages, but with different characteristics. Yes. Uh, so we so we will move to the second part, which talks about the model. So in the bar, we only mentioned like inference algorithms, that is assuming that we have a model to do the scoring. Especially, for example, for graph based parsing, we do the score of each of the subtrees. And for transition based parsing, we do the score of action condition on some states. And all of them need a model to do this scoring parts. And, like, a, a problem of this is that how do we design input features? And especially, like how do we design scoring model? Uh, actually, uh, I'll talk like in the timeline of the development of the features. So in the very old time, we have feature-based methods, which manually design features and use linear models to do the story. And uh, in our early time, so later we had like some early new ne neural network things to which can accept atom input features and use neural network to do the automatic feature combinations. And as we know that recently, we also have contextualized representations, especially the pre-training coders, which can like in any other NLP tasks which can improve the performance of the model. Uh, so here, I'll, I'll first slightly talk about the feature-based methods. So as you can see, like in before neural network, people are doing model. The models in NLP are mostly like this. We uh, people design manual feature templates to it. For example, here uh, I borrowed this feature template from this uh, paper, and there are three good. So here, this is. So here we want to score an edge inside a graph-based parser. So here, for example, in the sentence, I read the book dot. And we want to, for example, we want to score the edge between read and book. And we have like here, we have three groups of features. The first one is unibrand features. So that means, so here P means the parent node, uh, C means the children node, and word means that word itself, POS means the part of speech. And so here, if you look at the first feature, 
peer fruit and peer post text, then we have a feature. The parent is red and parent is a word. So this is one feature is a combination of these two. And what's more, we have like individual of them. The parent is red, uh, the parent, the word of parent is red, the parent post tag is word. And we also have similar things for the children. For example, here the children's book and the children's not. So here, for the combination of these two, we had to do this manually. This is, is specified in the feature template. And like, so in the first group, things are unigram. And I think the most important features in dependent parser would be like biogram, the pairwise thing, because we are doing like pairwise like classification. And you can see that the first feature, if we translate into this uh, specific case, that would be the parent is read and the parent and the parent is a word, the children is book and the children is a not. So this is one feature. And, the, and we have some like slight, slight different versions. Uh, the parent, uh, 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 the parent is, I'm uh, sorry, this is helpful. Parent is where the children is book and children's not. So this is the second uh, group of features. And lastly, we can also have some, uh, actually, in all, all time, we can also do some contextualization. We can keep the like nearby words in it. For example, here, the first, uh, the first thing here is, uh, is the parent is a word the, and the children is not, and there is terminal in between. So this is a, another feature. So as you can see, this first, this is very laborious because for each of the tasks, you have to design this kind of features. And especially you have to combine all of this manually. This is all built by hand, these templates. And another like major problem is sparsity because as, uh, as you can, because there are many different words in, uh, natural language, as you can imagine, this there, for our dependent parsing, even for our first order, there can be easily like, I remember that there can be easily like million speeches, especially like if you move to higher order ones, there can be easily million speeches. And in a linear model, this means that each, each of the feature will have one weight. And like, even in our like old linear model, we can easily have million weights inside this model. And like, it is hard to generalize in this session. And so later, like we people build their network to do this. And like, uh, I think this is one of the earliest paper doing this. So the good thing about neural network is that we only, we do not need to do this manual combination of them. We can input like atom features into the network. For example, uh, this is, is an example of transition-based parser. Things are at actually very similar to graph-based points. So for each of the thing we want to classify or we want to score, we simply put, we simply uh, embed all of the um, features into individual invariants. And then we can simply concatenate them and input to a like multi-layer neural network. And then we hope that the neural network can automatically combine the feature by themselves. And it turns out that they can, they can do, and they did a very good job of this. So if we look at this then, all of those combination of feature, for example, here, P word, P post, this kind of features will no longer be needed. The only needed features here would be the individual ones. So here I call the atom ones. So this um, this release people from doing this kind of manual design features. And as we know, uh, later on we have more complex networks. For example, like we can remember that for parsing, the input sentence are already given. So we can depend on the whole input sentence and we can build a uh, like contextualized uh, encoder to this. And in the early time, this will be our STM. And later we will also move to pre-trained ones. And, and so here, uh, so, so, so this, this work is about like input features and like this work is about the scoring of this, of the, um, of the parsing, especially previously, People are only concatenating all the features and using a full form network to do this. And like uh, this work, uh, actually I mentioned this because this is nowadays still the standard parsing scoring architecture. It is basically because for different parsing, we want, usually we want to com uh, score a pair of words. So basically they compute a, a representation for the, for the half word, compute a representation for the modifier word and use a tensor uh, in, uh, rather than concatenating them and use a feedforward to do the score, they use a tensor 
a production to do this. And this provides some uh, improvements over the previous methods. And uh, uh, as everyone knows, so recently we have pre-trained models to do this. And, and of course, like things improve for all these methods. And here's a, another paper which actually has a similar title, a tail of two parcels revisited. And it compares like, what if we have deep contextualized gradient balance? And in this case, if we want to com especially compare transition-based and graph-based parsings, what are their differences? So if you look at the right figure, the upper one is from the older comparisons. So here, MST means that it's a graph-based parsing. Uh, and mod is a transition-based parser, and ZPAR is a combination of these two. As you can see, as we move to the uh, longer dependency edge, so the graph-based graph parser are usually perform better. This is uh, reasonable because graph-based parser are usually like, globally more optimized, and the uh, transition-based parsers are not, uh, are usually look at local, uh, local decisions. But as, so here, the, if you look at the second figure, this is a comparison uh, of like, what if we have contextualized invariants? So, so here, plus means, E means that animal, we are using animal features. And plus B is that we are using bird features. And actually, if, if, we, if we do not use these contextualized uh, representations, again, like graph, so here, GR means graph, TR means transition graph-based parsers can be better in longer dependency edges. But as we use this more powerful, like contextualized representation, things are roughly similar, especially if you look at the plus B, birds one, like these two almost like have performed very similar across all dependency length. So, so there is their conclusion. The contextualized gradient bands can allow the parsers to pack information about global input sentence, and actually this make this transition-based parser, graph-based parser virtually equivalent in terms of both accuracy and error profile. So as you can see, the, so here is something, if you look at the like model architecture, either model architecture or parsing algorithms itself, I guess this, we cannot say this is a, like the neural network, especially recent pre-trend encodes might not be a huge change to the parsing models. And the basic, basic parsing paradigms are still almost the same, especially the uh, graph-based or transition-based methods. But actually this indeed brings some change, especially like this blur some of the distinctions between the graph-based and dependent, the graph-based and transition-based methods. Uh, because like, you know, mo most of the parameters inside this model will be like, will sit inside those larger encoders. And uh, as I mentioned before, the, when we're talking about computational complexity, we still, this indeed actually changed much. When, uh, so traditionally, when we're talking computational complexity, we usually mean that we're computing things on CPUs. And uh, in, that, uh, in that case, like, if you look at uh, runtime, runtime complexity for these algorithms, graph-based parser usually, usually use uncube, they are like unspoiled uh, algorithms, but usually it's uncube. And for transition-based parts, it's usually like linear time. There can be more complex ones. And in that case, like the uh, like image of people about this methods is that graph-based process is more like computational costly than the transition ones. But if we move to GPU, especially using neural networks, actually things can be interesting things. It's not, like the old way, especially for the graph based parsers. If, although we need to score each pair of the nodes, actually they can be easily parallelized. And like this is something GPU is very like it's very fond of. And if you look at transition based parsers, it's actually it is auto regressive model. You have to build a state and you have to apply the actions iteratively. And like this will, I'm not saying this is not this. I, I would say this is not super GPU friendly. I'm not saying this is impossible for GPU to do. You can like, but you need some extra efforts to build things, build as transition-based parsers on GPUs. And so currently, I think the standard parsing model is just birds plus or birds friends. 
plus a deep by five bar space parses. And so this will, will wrap up the models parts. And although like the current the, the models might not might not have too much uh, improve, improvement space, especially in the supervised case. And but what still remains interesting is the uh, data resources. And so we're entering the last part of this. So actually, like in in the like nearest like twenty years of corner shell task, there are six years like which is directly related with dependent parsing. The first two years is only only dependent parsing, and middle two year is dependent parsing plus semantic role parsing. And last, lastly, which is like most recently, it's about parsing to universal dependencies. And I would especially introduce, discuss slightly about universal dependencies. And uh, actually for English, especially for English, people usually do not construct directly annotated dependency trees. Most of the tree bank are actually converted from constituency trees. And you can imagine there are many different conversion methods to doing this. And here I list an example here, like where people can do different things. For example, consider this very simple, uh, simple sentence, go to school. Like here, like I think linguistic, linguistic themselves do have some, do not agree like for this prepositional phrase to school, which one had like, someone think like the position word to is the head. So in this case, like the dependency tree would be like, from go to two and two to school. But uh, in the recent UD styles, like people think that we should put content words to top that will encourage, uh, as I would describe it, encourage multilingual consistency. But, and so in this case, the dependency graph will be like from go to school and from, from school to two. So actually it's hard, if we only look at the monolingual case, it's hard to say like which one is correct or better. But it's just something that we need to uh, just we need to arrive at, at something consistent. And so uh, UD so aims to provide a consistent uh, cross-lingual annotations across many languages. And you can check uh, more details on it at its website. And it is updated every half year, so you can see like I guess two weeks later you will have 2.9. And now you can cover like uh, over 100 languages and you have like over 200 tree banks. It's a very large project. And uh, you did is not only to for dependent parsing, we also have universal part of speech text and universal morphology features. Uh, but the, uh, the core part of it is this, in this version two, it has seven, uh, 37 universal syntactic relations related to it. Uh, and, uh, it is a revised version of a previous, it's called Stanford dependencies. So as you can see, it's uh, mainly from English, but the aim of it is to extend to uh, multilingual cases. And here, here's a table that I screenshot from this uh, official website. Uh, you can click each of the, at this website, you can click each of the uh, specific relation and there are some like multilingual examples for it. And you can understand it. And uh, as you can see, like here are some familiar ones. For example, here, non-subject, which simply means subject, object is the object. And they have also like indirect object and also conjunction. And if you're interested, you can just uh, take a look. And they group things nicely into different uh, blocks, for example, like, uh, the first row will be the core arguments. The core arguments, uh, this is actually related with like semantic roles, which I think Bob will describe later. And the core arguments usually means that the, you know, the core dependency children for this word usually, as you can see, the subject and object. And there can be like non-core dependence, which is more like modifying things. For example, adverb or, so here oblique means that either like an adverb like phrase as the modifier. And as we discussed, like the, the aim of universal campuses is to provide a cross-lingual consistent tree band annotation. So here you can see here there are four languages 
and they, they are parallel. They, they are different uh, translations among each other. And they all say the dog was traced by the cat, but different languages has different ways to represent this. For example, in English, like the top one, we have the, but in other languages, uh, I, I believe second ones, Bulgaro and Czech and Swedish, they do not, you cannot find this kind of determinant. They, they simply, I, 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 I do not know, but I think, especially in this, in this sentence, they do not need a determinant to decide things. And especially, for example, look, if you look at auxiliary words, which indicates the passive voice, like some of the language have this kind of passive sig signature, but especially like in the last case, they do not have this kind of passive signature. So the, the, the like the one of the main principle of universal, universal dependencies is that they put the content one to the top of the sheet. So if you look, if you look at the highest level of the sheet, so it will be the, like the main verb is trace and the dog is subject and the cat is, is oblique. And then if you look at other uh, structures, especially the highest levels of structures of the other languages, they are roughly similar. So here we have the main word and it has a non-subject and it has an oblique. So basically this will encourage like different languages to have roughly similar structures. And this will, uh, as described here, this will like facility multilingual parsing and maybe potentially like the usefulness of of parsing structures through more downstream parts. And one specific interesting, if we have this kind of cross-lingual consistent annotation is that we can do some cross-lingual transfer over it. So here by cross-lingual transfer, so, uh, so here I mean that's, imagine that we have some high resource languages. For example, for in, in English, we have many annotated tree banks, but in some low resource ones, we do not have such much, that much annotations. But actually one specific thing we can do is that we can transfer from this high resource language to the low resource ones. And actually, because UD annotated things consistently across language, we have, we can, it can provide a test bed for doing this. And in a very extreme case, we have the zero shot transfer case, uh, scenario. Uh, so here means it means that we do not have any tree for the target language. We only have uh, some uh, tree annotations for the source language. Actually, like things can be very easy if we have some aligned information across the language. Uh, so here, one simple thing that we can do is that we use uh, English trees to chain English parser with English imbalance. And at test time, if we have a foreign language, we find we simply change the input imbalance to a line imbalance. For example, here, we when we want to transfer from English to French, we simply change the English embeddings into, but, but here we need to align those embedding into the same space. And then we, at test time, we simply uh, change the English embeddings into French embeddings. Actually, it, it can produce, and the parser is still English chain parsers. And actually, surprisingly, in this case, like especially for the close related language like English to French, th they can produce very reasonable outputs. And of course, recently we have like multilingual contextualized encoders. And in this case, things are more things are easier to do because we do not need, even need to put a speech th these aligned imbalance of different languages and the multi multilingual encoder already have some alignments inside of it for all these languages. And, and actually this also surprisingly work well. And an, an interesting open question is that how birds or multilingual birds encode syntax. So that it, it itself already knows some alignments of syntactic information inside it. And actually UD is not without any problems because it is, it is not developed, developed by like one group or one person. It is an open collaboration project from like people around the world. And especially many of the tree banks are actually converted from previous constituency tree banks rather than directly annotated to this, uh, according to these annotations. And, and there can be some information loss. And one specific 
its specific thing about it is that it is English centric because it is derived from Stanford premises. And some of the choice, so people have uh, have some discussions of whether these certain choices of the UDs will be reasonable. For example, like its arguments or adjuncts and its coordination structures. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, aligning that is that you can imagine that things are aligned in same space. For example, like in English, we have some words of like, uh, I don't know, fish or like animals or uh, I think fruits. And in French, you know that the string, the string of it will be different. But if we check the, because in, in both the same values, one word is represented by a vector. And here alignment means that there are similar words like translation between different words will lie in similar space inside uh, if you look at that structure. Yeah, sure. uh, so, uh, so finally, this is small wrap up. And so we'll talk about algorithms for it. There are two different Various of it, and we talk about some models for it. And finally, we have we discuss like this cross lingual consistent duty. And here are some like related reference for it. And are there any questions? So if you could uh, connect to Zoom and let me know if anything comes up on chat. So, so we're going to switch to the second part of the lecture. Okay. So uh, let me know if this uh, doesn't show up on Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so as you saw in talk about dependency parsing, and there are basically five other really important things I think you need to know about syntax. And so we're gonna try to go through those five things uh, in the rest of today's lecture. One, uh, who knows what the difference is between a context-free language and a not context-free language? I think there are only like one or two people. Okay, good. So this is actually really interesting. And this, when computer science, yes. Oh dear. I'm going to show you half the slide. What can you see now, Anji? Yeah, I ran them once before. I might do this. Uh, is it readable, Anji? I might just do it this way. Just this sometimes happens, and I don't know how to fix that. Um, so the interesting thing is that when computer science got started, it was actually started by mathematicians before World War II who were trying to figure out how to do automatic calculations, how to automatically prove things. And, the, and because they were just trying to do computer science, they weren't really trying to do languages, but they decided to term the problems in terms of producing sentences. So they produced sentences and theorems, and so they actually talked about it as language. They wanted to produce conceptual machines that would generate uh, language talking about math. Um, and so the theories they produced uh, were phrased even in terms of machines like the finite states transducers that we saw before, or grammar sets, uh, like sets of rules that would rewrite things to produce other things. And a whole bunch of different people produced different models. And they were totally shocked when uh, eventually it turned out that these are all related to each other very strictly by mathematical proofs. 
it was a huge shock because different people invented these at different times with different purposes. And it turns out all of these models uh, basically collapse into four different categories. Um, and so the first category are finite state machines and regular grammars. We saw finite state machines when we were talking about doing morphology, right? Um, and the second category is actually context-free grammars, uh, which are also related to stack machines that are pushed on automata. And so context-free grammars, you can prove they're actually strictly more powerful than regular uh, expressions or finite state machines. So finite state machines, and there's an interesting trade-off in this hierarchy that the further, in this case, uh, the further down you go in the hierarchy, the more powerful things get, but the more expensive it is to use them. And so there's a expressivity and power versus complexity trade-off. And it was kind of surprising to everybody that uh, these four categories are, are a proper subsets. So you can prove that, that each is a subset of the other one and that there are things that are not in the other subset. Um, and at the bottom, you get Turing machines, which is basically computers, right? So, so type zero machines we know have undecidable problems. There are things that cannot be solved. Um, and so you want to avoid using that if you can help it, uh, you know, because that's like debugging programs. You know, you have a giant program that does your language for you with like no, you know, tighter organization. And so people would like to use context-free grammars to do language because it's pretty clear that you can't really do the grammars you want to do with just regular expressions. And so people try to use context-free grammars. But sometimes it feels like that doesn't work. And so what people often end up doing is they'll build a basically context-free system or what they call a context-free backbone. And then they'll cheat and they'll add little tricks to it to like pass around information. It's kind of like kids in class passing notes to each other. And like the passing this information around kind of breaks the context-free nature of it. But if you're very careful about how you do it and you don't do too much and it, you can still parse things quickly. So you're, you're trying to avoid a complexity explosion in doing the analysis by trying to keep things context-free. Uh, and this hierarchy is called the Chomsky hierarchy because the guy who like finally defined the whole thing was Noam Chomsky. Who's heard of Chomsky? He's like very famous, right? He, his, like his, he's the second most published thing in English after the Bible. Uh, you know, he's like, uh, it's probably because in addition to doing computer science and linguistics, he's also a left-wing politician. Uh, and so he's, uh, uh, during the Vietnam War, he started like making trouble uh, and has like continued to do that. And uh, so he's very, very famous. He did a lot of really smart things. He might not always be right about language. There's a kind of a big fight in linguistics between people who think he's right and not right about different things. Um, but uh, he was the one who, who proved the last bits of this thing and put this hierarchy together. The really interesting thing from my point of view is that in this hierarchy, um, you can see that there are these four levels and like type two is really not powerful enough. So you might think that the next one down would do it, but that's already kind of too powerful. And so people have come up independently again with a bunch of different things that are called mildly context sensitive grammars where um, they're kind of like context-free, but they add some kind of uh, mechanisms that are not context-free. And if you're very, very careful, you can keep it from exploding. And so you might hear about CCGs or tag grammars or other kinds of formalisms. And those are actually not context-sensitive anymore, but by being very, very careful, they can keep them from exploding in power. And it's a little, a little bit ironic because Chomsky originally did this hierarchy to try to figure out how language works how human languages work. It's actually much more applicable to computer languages than human languages, uh, because it seems like the real kind of dividing line is in between two of these categories. So that's what mildly context sensitive grammars are. Uh, and since this came up before, I thought I'd just pop this up. Uh, one of the things that people argue about is what kind of processing human beings can really do. So if you write a normal grammar of English, all these sentences are fine, because you can embed sentences in another sentence. So anybody can understand the cat likes tuna fish. Saying that the, the cat the dog chase likes tuna fish is also fine. But for me, the third one already I can't really do. Uh, the cat the dog, the mouse scared chase likes tuna fish. If I, if I like look at it written down, I can figure it out. 
But you can keep going. As far as the grammar is concerned, you can put as many in there as you want. But I'm really sure nobody can understand the cat, the dog, the mouse, the elephant, the flea, bit, squash, pear, chase, likes to it, <laughs> right? I can't understand that at all. Only with the colors and like with drawing lines and stuff. And so there's a distinction between what the rules say ought to work and what people can really do. And so that's interesting for people who are trying to figure out how human beings pro you know, process language. So that's all I want to say about uh, formal language theory, unless there's a burning question, you can take lots of classes in this, it's really interesting. Um, the, so that was the first topic. Uh, the next topic is uh, actually two topics that are related, is feature structures and verb subcategorization or subcat frames. And one, one of the kind of overarching uh, principles of all this is that human language is really complex and so there are kind of multiple overlapping systems that kind of describe part of what's going on. And you sometimes have to use like these different systems together to really capture everything that's going on. Just because language is so complex. So we saw before in the, in the talk about morphology that there is this inflectional morphology that from kind of the second category there, where um, there are features that are marked on words that have to agree between different parts of the sentence. And in order, in order to have the sentences make sense to a native speaker, in order for them to be grammatical to a native speaker, you have to do this right. And that's actually a not context-free mechanism uh, because different sections are kind of like communicating with each other. And we saw that the typical way of, of processing individual words was you can build these finite state machines that will take the uh, surface form like foxes, convert the spelling into what you really mean, which is fox plus an S, and then convert that again into fox and uh, features that say it's a noun and it's plural. And so you, by doing the morphological processing, you get these abstract features that tell you linguistically what people are, you know, what, what, what information you're trying to communicate, right? So it's, if it's a noun, it's plural. Uh, so, Jisong, is there, uh, I see chat numbers. Is there anything important happening in the chat? Okay, good. Um, so, uh, so, we have these linguistic features and they're agreement constraints. And the question is, how do you make sure these things agree? Now, in order to make sure that the uh, person, so in English, it's still very simple, but even in English, it already makes trouble because it's not context free. So, in English, uh, the third person uh, singular, the verb has this S on the end, right? So he swims, I swim, they swim, he swims. We add this S just to make trouble, okay? But if you don't do it right, people don't understand it and it's weird and they think you're dumb. So, you know, you have to do it right. You could actually do that in a context-free fashion by having a billion rules. <laughs> so you, instead of just having a noun phrase, you could have, different kinds of noun phrases. You get a first person singular noun phrase, first person plural noun phrase, and have, you can have like noun phrases, verb phrases, and, and uh, sentences that each have all different combinations of features, but that would explode gigantically. And so nobody wants to do that. And so instead of doing that, we have these separate features, okay? And these features just say, okay, you know, um, uh, I'll have a noun phrase and I'll just separately remember if it's singular or first person. And when I connect the noun phrase with the context free rule to the other things in the grammar, I'll check to make sure that these are compatible. I'll check to make sure the features are compatible, right? And so these features are introduced in the lexicon. And so the word for dogs says, this is plural, it's got a little plus PL in the, in the dictionary. And then when you have a sentence with the word dog in it, this feature gets introduced and the grammar rules that combine dog with the other words always check to make sure that the features are compatible and they pass them on to the next level up in case there's something further up that has to be compatible. Does that make sense? So once you start doing this with a bunch of features and you have hierarchies, you can have hierarchies of features. You can have a feature that has structure in it that's more features you end up with feature structures, which turn out to be a really handy thing that you'll see occasionally if you, if you work with language stuff. 
Um, and so you can build these uh, structures out of features that have features whose values are more structures of features. And so you can build this kind of tree structure of features. And when you do this, uh, if, you, if you do this in your lexicon, so for example, if you know that the word A uh, in this example, A is a determiner that's singular, um, and you have an NP rule that says that, uh, uh, well, yeah, sorry. Uh, so you have these rules that say, okay, a sentence is made up of a noun phrase followed by a verb phrase. And then you can have an equation attached to the rules that says they have to agree in number. So in English, you don't have to agree in other things between the subject and the verb. In other languages you do, so this is part of the definition of the language. But in English, the subject and the verb phrase have to agree in number. Um, and then when you have the rule for the noun phrase, it says that the, uh, the noun phrase that they, they had, the, the determiner has to agree with the noun and that becomes the number of the whole phrase. And so these equations are part of the definition of the language and they check this information and pass it around and make sure it's consistent. Right? But this, all this stuff is non-context free, these, these rules passing information around. So once you're already doing this, and so this is an example where um, the, uh, the lexicon entry in the top left has number singular in it. The rule that builds a noun phrase says that the uh, phrase's number will be the same as the determiner's number. And so when you, when you apply that rule to this uh, uh, word A to, to start building up an analysis of it, uh, everything says, okay, it's gotta be number singular, right? So, so the, the rules propagate that information. So once you're already doing this, it turns out there's a similar problem with verbs. So there's like a hundred different kinds of verb phrases in English, depending on how many objects you've got and what kind of object. So traditionally people talk about intransitive, transitive, and maybe bitransitive sentences. So the unmarked noun phrases, the noun phrases that don't have a preposition on them in English, there can either be just none like Jack laughed. That's a complete sentence. You don't need an object but Jack found a key. And so finding needs an object. You can't just say Jack found. That doesn't mean anything. Uh, and you can also have two objects. So you can say Jack gave Sue the paper, right? And so for specific verbs, specific combinations of these things are required or not. And so each verb has a, a, a set of arguments, they call them. Uh, it's the same thing as in a function and an argument. Because in the, in the representation of the meanings of sentences, people generally represent the verb as a function and the other noun phrases and prepositional phrases are arguments of that function, just, just like in programming, which is not an accident. That's where it came from in programming. Um, and so in order to, you could do this by having a, a hundred, hundreds of different verb phrase rules. But instead, we're going to use features because we already got features working. Mm -hmm. There's no warning on halfway through. Um, so, so there are sets of what they call subcategorization frames, or sometimes abbreviated as subcat frames. And this is just basically saying for any given verb, what set of prepositional phrases and possibly uh, verb phrases, subordinate verb phrases, and noun phrases can be included together. So you've got things like Jack laughed, Jack found a key, Jack wants to fly. So one thing can have a to and a verb phrase after it, or Jack likes flying. Uh, and so it can have a, a, a ing form of a verb. And these are all specific to the verbs, which means that they're in the lexicon. So in the, in the dictionary entries for a verb, it has to say which of these frames it can use. And any given instance of the verb can only use one. You can't mix and match them uh, or it becomes ungrammatical. And so one way to see that this really is part of the definition of the language, you're, you might be tempted to think this is based on the meaning, right? So like laughing is something you can do without doing it to anything. So it's partly based on the meaning, but it's partly just uh, the definition of the language. So you can say, John wants to fly and John likes to fly. You can say John likes flying, but you can't say John wants flying. Right? That's not right. 
Um, there's no good meaning reason. You could, in, you know, in principle, you could say John wants flying. There's probably languages where that works, uh, but not in English. And so that kind of shows that this is uh, arbitrary and just part of the definition of the words of the language. And this actually changes in different areas. So if anybody's heard, of, who's heard of Pittsburghese, <laughs> right? So like the local Pittsburgh dialect is actually, I have a map outside my office of the dialects of the US and there's this big red circle around Pittsburgh. Uh, the, the local people like, like waitresses and, and stuff in Pittsburgh will say things differently than I will or people at CMU from other places because there's an actual real local Pittsburgh dialect. And one of the famous examples is that Pittsburghers will say the car needs washed, which to me isn't right. To me, that's like you left out the word to be. Uh, but in Pittsburgh, the verb need has a different frame that doesn't exist in the rest of the US. <laughs> uh, and so people, you'll see jokes about Pittsburghese and they'll often say the car needs washed, my homework needs done. They'll use needs without uh, uh, anything between it and the verb after it. And that's a Pittsburgh verb frame that, I think it actually comes from Scotland maybe, uh, but other places in the US don't do that, okay? So in the interest of not hurrying too much, I'll skip over some of the examples of this. They'll be in the slides, but it works the same way the other, the other uh, features work, you have a feature that says which frame you're using and you have that feature on the verb. And so the verb phrase inherits that and the verb phrase checks to make sure that you get the right kinds of arguments uh, that match your frame. And one interesting thing is that by with this much stuff together, you've almost invented LFG. So a very popular grammatical formalism is called le lexical functional grammar it's from I'm going to forget now, uh, MIT actually. So these people actually fight with Chomsky a lot. Uh, uh, it's a different grammatical formalism that came from MIT originally. Um, and uh, Chomsky's at MIT. Uh, and uh, basically this is a notational variant of, of lexical functional grammar or LFG. So LFG is based on the idea that we're going to have these features and you can do very powerful things in LFG with features I'm just going to mention there's this uh, technique called unification that at times has been very important. Um, nowadays, people don't use it very much as far as I know. If you use LFG or one of the related formalisms, you'll need to learn this. But basically, it's a very powerful mechanism for uh, checking and unifying constraints. And uh, one way to look at it is that it's kind of a new function of, of saying something is equal. So like when you learn to program, you discover that there's a difference between making something equal and checking that it's equal, right? So there's the assignment statement that makes two things, makes the thing on the left be the thing on the right. And there's the predicate that says, are these two things equal? So the unification says something different. This says, merge these two things, merge these two things. And if there's a conflict, fail. And so there's, there's like two possible results. You either get the merged output of the two things or something inconsistent, you get a fail uh, exception basically. Uh, and so you can like start merging the top thing and it recursively merges everything down below it. And if anything fails anywhere, the whole thing fails. And if it doesn't, you get the merged thing. It's a tricky, complicated thing and very powerful because it is a non-context free operation. And so, uh, there's a question like, why would you do something tricky and hard? And the answer is, is that if you, if you get this, if you build a machine that does this right once and use it a lot, it's really worthwhile because there are these constructions of embedded sentences where it seems like one thing is the subject of two different parts. So if I say there seems to be a dog in the yard or there seems to be dogs in the yard, the verb at the top of the sentence is actually agreeing in number with this noun that's buried down below it. And this can get arbitrarily far apart in deeper nesting verb phrases. And the easiest way to make that work is to say, well, they're the same thing. Uh, the subjects of these different things are all the same thing. But that's a non-context free operation. So if you're really careful that it doesn't explode. So there are lots of things you can learn about LFG uh, if, if you decide to go in that direction. And in fact, uh, the old, 
Jurassic and Martin book talk about unification. And they only mention it's really expensive, uh, but this is like NP complete. Uh, so if you're not careful, this becomes NP complete and just impossibly hard to do. And actually some of the work here at LTI over the years has been in producing uh, unification based systems that don't explode and that you can actually really use uh, to do stuff. So that was the second and third things I wanted to tell you about. And so the, the last two, I think, really important concepts from uh, syntax that you need to know. Uh, we mentioned one of them in the first half of the talk, uh, uh, just saw mentioned the uh, semantic roles. And so we're gonna look at semantic roles and some aspects of them. Who's ever heard of semantic roles before? I know who the linguist in the crowd are. Uh, so, um, so there's this idea that, that got really popular in the 60s and 70s. A guy named Fillmore kind of started it. And the idea was, so you've got, I mentioned that, you know, the, the meanings of verbs, the meanings of sentences are basically almost always interpreted as the verb is kind of a function. And then the function has arguments. And so the noun phrases and the prepositional phrases attached to the verb at the level of meanings are the arguments of these functions. And so the question would be, well, you know, as you know, like, you know, the different arguments of a function do different things, right? And so you want to make sure you get that alignment right. And it turns out that you can look at this um, as a part of a, a frame. The, we just talked about the subcategorization frame that determines the syntax of the verb phrase. Well, there can also be a semantic part of that. So if I say John broke the window with a hammer, John is the actor. John is the person making something happen. And many, many verbs have a subject normally that is making the thing happen. At least in English, it's typically the subject. And there's often something that something happens to it. And so John broke the window. John is doing it, and the window is having something happen to it. And so these are kind of the two most obvious uh, argument types that are true across lots of verbs. And then there's another one called an instrument, which is something that the agent used to do the thing that happened. And so John broke the window with a hammer. Now, the thing that causes trouble is that it's totally natural to say the hammer broke the window, right? But the hammer, the hammer doesn't do stuff by itself. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of verbs where you can get rid of the actor and make the subject in English uh, the instrument. So the hammer broke the window is clearly the same. You know, it's the same thing that happened with John broke the window with a hammer. You just don't know who did it. And so the hammer now, even though it's a subject, it's still the instrument. And the window is still the, uh, the thing that got broken. But you can even say the window broke. Uh, and so the window is clearly not doing something. It's having something done to it. And so the window is still the, what they call the patient or the theme. It's the thing what something happened to. But you've gotten rid of the other argument. And all three of these versions of broke are fine. Native speakers don't even notice this is going on until you point it out to them. And sometimes you can be wrong. So you say John broke the window when Bill threw him through it. Now, now John is not the, John's actually the instrument now by accident. Uh, you know, and so one of the tricky things about language is that, you know, you can always come up with examples that break everything. Uh, but there's this normal, normal uh, scheme where the agent is the subject. Um, and at a logical level, there's a problem that I'll just not go into to save time. But basically, if you're, if you're, well, if you're using the arguments as the surface level arguments, you have this problem that you've got multiple different versions of the same function with different arguments, which is kind of a mess. So like the logicians were worried about this part of it, it makes the logical system hard to, to work. So the most obvious example that works really well over lots of verbs is the agent. Uh, then there's the theme, and then there's the, the instrument in this previous sentence. And so these roles are a way of explicitly saying which argument this is in the predicate at, at the meaning level. We'll talk more about meanings next time. Um, uh, and so as with other things in linguistics, uh, you need to have tests to decide what, what is going on. And so one of the things they talk about for deciding when something's the agent is, is the, the agent is the instigator. And so one of the things you can do is you can ask if you can add the word intentionally. So John intentionally broke the window is fine. The hammer intentionally broke the window is not fine, unless it's a robot hammer. 
right? Um, and so, um, you know, the agent has to be able to intentionally do things. And the second most consistent role is the theme, which is the thing that something happens to it. And so can you say, what was X for the verb X? The gray eagle saw the mouse, what was seen, the mouse. And so the mouse is the theme. And many, many verbs have a theme, which is the, the thing that something happened to, if it's, a, if it's an event. Okay. Um, and so then, well, there's a great idea. Hey, you know, this works for two roles. Let's do it for all of them. Uh, and so there's been this, this actually started like more than 2,000 years ago. Uh, a guy named Panini uh, in India was working on this at the same time that the Greeks were working on this kind of thing in, in Greece. Um, and you come up with these sets of thematic roles where you've got some kind of a definition, you've got a name for the role, and it should work across a bunch of languages. I should point out that this is an odd joke in the book. Uh, uh, the waiter did not purposely spill the soup, I hope. Uh, you know, so the, this example, the waiter spilled the soup implies the waiter's doing it on purpose because he's the agent. Um, and so you have these things and like the agent and the theme and the instrument are pretty clear, but then there's this urge to try to make all the arguments work in a way that works with all verbs and all languages. And that's very controversial, uh, which I'll get back to in a second. So basically we mentioned this verb subcategorization so you can combine what the, what the surface form of the argument is with what the role is in the semantics. And you get what they call a thematic grid or a case frame. And so for these different versions of the verb broke, you've got different versions of frames. And so there's one frame that says that the subject is the agent and the object is the theme. And you have to have both of them. So one thing that the frame does is it tells you what arguments are required. So the child broke the vase. Uh, that's using the frame where the subject is the agent and the object is the theme. If the child broke the vase with a hammer, there's an optional argument of the instrument, which will be a prepositional phrase in English. And whether they're the subject or object or prepositional phrase is part of the definition of the language again. Um, the hammer broke the vase. You've got two arguments, but now the subject is the instrument. And so the frame indicates that. And if the vase broke, you only have one argument, which is the subject and it's the theme. And so this information can be in the lexicon. If your lexicon is going to handle semantics, you're going to need to do something like this. So that you know, you know what the roles of each of the arguments are of the verb in the meaning of the sentence. Does that make sense? And then another name for this in, in uh, linguistics is diathesis alternation. They, they like hard names, I don't know. Um, but basically, uh, this can happen with a single verb where you move the different arguments around uh, and it all means the same thing. Chris gave a book to Dana. A book was given to Dana by Chris. Chris gave Dana a book. Dana was given a book by Chris. It means all the same thing, but they each is a different frame with different roles for the different arguments. But it all ends up having the same meaning in the logical form because they each have these different frames. <coughs> And so people tried to make this completely general across all languages and Fillmore tried to argue that this was really general across all languages. Most people who are not Fillmore don't think that's true. Uh, and so based on these properties, there's actually two important, because it's a complicated, tricky thing, there's two different big databases that are available uh, for English and other languages too, I believe. Um, One's called prop bank or proposition bank, and the other is called frame net. And because the generalization of this is tricky, they've taken two different approaches. So prop bank decided this is really tricky to generalize. We're going to do it separately for every verb. So in prop bank, every verb has its own set of arguments that are just called arg0, arg1, arg2, and so on. And they describe what the role is in the semantics. And because the agent and the patient, those are the two things that are pretty clear across lots of verbs. Arg zero and arg one are always the agent and patient. Uh, but the other ones are all verb specific because they just kind of like gave up on generalizing. They're just too hard. You know, we want to get this done. Um, and so they took Penn Tree Bank and annotated a whole bunch of it with these uh, propositions and arguments. And uh, for, for verbs that don't have an agent like falling, they don't use an arg zero. So you can see for falling, arg1 is the subject, which is the thing that falls. 
And then there are other possible arguments that you can add to the sentence. You know, the, the, the meteor fell through the atmosphere. Uh, sales fell to $251 million from $278 million. And so you can have all these different arguments. And so this defines them for each verb that they find in the tenses of. Now, the other approach was taken by the FrameNet people. And this is actually Fillmore's folks, uh, Fillmore and his friends, uh, who you know, thought that this stuff should generalize across all languages and across all verbs. And because that's tricky, what they're doing, what they've done, is that they take these things and they define semantic frames, uh, you know, semantic ideas that have arguments. And they start that with the main thing, and then they fit the verb into them. So instead of having like the verb sell as a separate thing from increase, they've got a single frame called change position on a scale. And so they have this change position on a scale and it has abstract arguments like the attribute that is changed, the difference is the distance it changes by, there's an initial state and a final state and so on. And then for each of the verbs that describes a change of a position on a scale, they tell you how those connect to this frame. Right, and so the kind of nice thing about this is that you can recognize synonyms and you can understand like when two different verbs are saying the same thing. In the prop bank thing, you don't really have that. The prop bank thing does each verb separately. And so there's no clue that fell and increase are like related anyway. Whereas here you've kind of got some real meaning. And so all these verbs like advance, climb, decline, decrease, diminish, dip, double, drop, dwindle, and so on. You know, one meaning of all those verbs connects to this frame and it tells you how the arguments fit together. Uh, with this frame. And that's a lot more work. And so I think they haven't done as many frames, uh, but for the things they've worked on, you get a lot of information. And so in the same way that many words connect to this one frame, each word has a number of frames that has more than one meaning. So the verb rise can be a change of a position on a scale, but it can also be changing posture, like when you rise in the morning. Uh, uh, it can be a, a direction like the balloon rose upward. Uh, it can be something in the sky coming over the horizon, the, the moon rose. Uh, and so they kind of have a fine grained distinction of the different meanings that the verb rise can have. And that plugs in different of these uh, deep frames that they use in the frame map. Um, so the remaining 60 seconds. Um, and so there's a slide here where we kind of show the same sentence annotated by prop bank and frame net. So you can kind of see how the two compare. Um, and it'd be really nice if these two things are somehow plugged together. And it turns out there's something called Sumlink that produced a united, unified verb index that connects the prop bank, verb net, frame net, and word net. Uh, and so there is a, a resource that tries to plug these things together so that you can actually like use them together. And I'll just mention semantic role labeling. Uh, there's a task people have where you try to take sentences and mark the different arguments with what the semantic role is, which gives you a lightweight version of semantics. And even though it's shallow and lightweight, it's really hard to get right because you kind of have to understand what the sentences are to get this right. Um, and so people work on this as a, as a kind of a sequence labeling task or you know a, a structured prediction task or something. Uh, but it's, it's hard. Uh, uh, to get it right. So, any questions? Hopefully, that was a little less fast than last time, but fast enough. Uh, okay. Uh, so, next time we will talk about semantics. It says dialogue. It says discourse on the slides, but that's going to change the semantics. I think we we're kind of like we. They took a week off of the semester. And so uh, there's not a lot of room. And I think it's more important to cover semantics a bit than, than, than discourse. So, so we'll talk about semantics more next time. But this is kind of a this is kind of a segue from syntax into semantics because they, they connect. Right? So thank you. <laughs>